this is my last episode before the end of the year. So thanks very much for, for joining today. Um, look, well, let's just jump straight into it and start through talking through our topics. But um, yeah, please go ahead and introduce yourself and, and yeah, tell us a bit about yourself. Perfect. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm Phil. Philip, thank you for having me on. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, currently a um, Rust engineer at um, Polygon Labs. And um, yeah, we'll get to that. But basically, um, yeah, I started in, in software engineering, computer science uh, back in, in Montreal. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I started, let's say, it, maybe if I trace back, I like my first big internship, let's say, was in Microsoft back uh, went to Vancouver, like the whole trip was great. Um, but uh, I, you know, I learned I didn't really want to work in a big company, at least not yet. Yeah. Um, and so I decided to not like keep working there and stuff and, and come back. And I got into robotics because I was like, I, I want to do something that's that really merges math and also uh, like computer science, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so I, I got into that. I met uh, my one of my well, my future uh, master's advisor, Liam Paul, awesome, awesome guy. Um, and uh, I, I took his class at University of Montreal. Uh, yep. Ducky Town was amazing. Um, really recommend it. You should look it up, Ducky Town. And um, yeah, basically from there, I, I, I got into robotics, and he referred me to one of his. Um, former colleagues uh, in the self-driving car industry. And uh, that was my first job. So I went to Michigan um, after, after I was done with, um, uh, with my undergrad, I went uh, to work for about a year for main mobility, uh, write self-driving car code. Um, it was all in C, so we can get into that after. Sure. Uh, you know, it blends into my love for Rust because I did a lot of C and um, yeah, um, but I went back to do my master's after about a year because I wanted to really deep dive into the math that I didn't really get to learn um, in my computer science. And, you know, maybe computer science students won't understand that. We see <laughs> sure. engineering level math, but we never really deep dive. I, I wanted to take the time to deep dive. So I did that for about two years. Never completed my master's for, you know, long reasons. And, uh, uh, like, it was, it, it, it was, I just didn't want to do AI anymore. I, I did the master's in AI and yep. uh, I just didn't want to do it anymore. And, you know, Liam was really understanding and I went into blockchain uh, after that um, mm -hmm. because I found that it was like, we will also get into that, but an awesome industry. Um, I would write some rust <laughs> and um, uh, yeah. And, and basically um, a lot of math specifically with all the cryptography stuff. Uh, that was like the math, like I, I, I felt like I got that, uh, that mix of, com of programming and really being mathy at the same time. Um, yep. So Jen, my, my first job was at the Informal Systems, another great company, um, uh, working on specifically IBC, so a protocol to let blockchains talk to one another. Um, mm -hmm. Everything in Rust, I was super happy. Um, uh, I, that was my first like real, I had learned Rust, but when you use it uh, a lot, you you there you know obviously you get a lot better and you understand mm -hmm. things way like way more deeply and so on. Um, yeah, so I, I I did that for you know about two years, and I I really wanted to go into uh, this, this zero knowledge uh, subfield, let's say, of blockchain, uh, the zero knowledge stuff, um, and so the the Maiden team at the Polygon was like the perfect fit for me. And yeah. uh, I'm here now and I'm working on the Maiden roll up, the Maiden VM, and we can get into all that, but yeah. So. Amazing, what a journey. I mean, we spoke the other week about it. It's like such a wild and maybe different, tra not traditional, let's say, journey to get to where you're at ra right now, which is probably quite inspirational to some because it's, uh, it's certainly a field uh, and an area, like you said, we'll get into it, but it's a field and area that's been blowing up like crazy in the last three months um from from my perspective it's probably always been blowing up but from what i've seen in the last three months in terms of the investments being made there um vc firms are releasing a shed load of cash into into the space and 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 research has been i mean ramped up massively so for people that maybe aren't in that space right now 
uh, to see that, hey, it can be done is is amazing. Let's go back though, like to, to what year were you in kind of the self self-driving space? Because that's obviously another industry, especially in Rust for this year that I've seen a lot of growth and potential in. Um, a lot more companies kind of adopting that stack um, into their work, which is probably quite understandable, maybe more so understandable for someone who's actually worked in there. But yeah, when did, when did, what year was that? Because that must have been. Yes, uh, 2018. So uh, I did it back in 2018. Um, my understanding that that industry, and I still have friends who are, are, are doing self-driving cars to this day. Yeah. It's the first time I hear that some projects are, uh, so some teams are adopting Rust, which I'm super happy. Um, the, 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 Culture in, in the self-driving car comes a lot from the auto industry. Yeah. And so it is a lot of C++. A lot of engineers who did uh, like automotive stuff with for like Bosch and whatnot, um, yep. or the big ones in the US, um, came and, and they know C++. And, and so they th that's that's what they, they build their stack on. Uh, I'm very happy to hear that some are, are starting to switch to Rust. Yeah, yeah. I know. I read. I I need to find it and dig it out somewhere because about a month ago I read uh, something that Ford put out. I, either I read something or maybe it was like a video. Um, but yeah, Ford. Someone from Ford was talking about how completely outdated, maybe not their stack is per se, but like just in general the automotive industry uh, technology stack is so outdated, like unbelievably bad um that okay. something like rust maybe shaking things up a little bit is probably um due to happen but yeah no definitely there's i mean this year we've seen a real sharp rise in in the industry in general and then when you start diving a bit deeper and seeing what they're using like rust seems to be popping up quite a lot there so it's in, it's, it's quite interesting but yeah to have been involved in that even in 2018 is pretty cool that's that was like a really disruptive thing back then you know now it's just as disruptive and just as important really so cool and then that transition into the blockchain and and that that's amazing and here we are today working on some pretty exciting stuff but yeah we'll, we'll dive into that but obviously your background like many others stemmed from like a, a c c plus plus kind of background um and then made that transition across into rust first of all how, how did you find that transition is is that myth real you know that the learning curve is pretty steep and tough or did you find it relatively okay like what, what was what's your quick take on that yeah, I mean, I totally understand where this comes from. Um, it is definitely steeper than, let's say, you know, learning Python or JavaScript or even Java and whatnot. Um, I think for me, it was not too bad because I it, it came you know a bit later in my career, you know, after you know what seven, eight, nine, I forget years that I started learning it, and I had done um, you know, a lot of C and mm -hmm. a decent amount of functional programming. With, you know, I did some Lisp and things like that too. Um, and then you get what I really like about Rust is it merges these two, um, yeah, these two together. The performance, like characteristics of C, um, and or, or the focus maybe of C, and the beautiful ideas of like OCaml and like pattern matching and yep. things like that um, that you see normally more in in, in functional programming languages and so you get to write efficient code with beautiful um constructs let's say uh yeah and that's what i i, I but 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 for the learning curve I, I think yeah if if you were never introduced to either like c stuff that you're used to thinking about memory and so on and also you're not too comfortable with things like pattern matching or really iterator based yeah. like map filter things like that fold um then then i can t totally and russ adds its own things on top of that so yeah uh, <laughs> I, I can understand why people uh find it hard absolutely do you think it's is it getting easier do you think in your opinion like i don't know if you work with people that have only just started using rust recently but like i i would be intrigued to know if someone who started learning it five years ago versus now if people are finding it easier now maybe i don't know the language has obviously evolved in itself but Perhaps, well, I know there's more material out there for you to dive into, so it should be a little bit easier. Or is it just at the end of the day, at the core of it, it can be quite tough to learn and it will always be like that? I don't know. Um, I think um, it, so it is very much a function of your background when you start learning it. Yeah. And if it starts to 
or if it influences, in, in my opinion, I, I have not experienced it being easier or harder. Uh, it's relatively recent, or at least that it uh -huh. became super popular. It's relatively recent. Uh, I think if it starts influencing computer science degrees, like uh, curriculums, yeah. Uh, maybe professors will start including more or focusing more on, okay, let's talk about map, filter, fold. This is important. Uh, I mean, not to say that these topics are not introduced, but not everywhere. I was not introduced uh, to those specifically in my curriculum. Um, or, or, oh, yeah, maybe we talk more about C or, or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, unless you've been, you, you've had, you, you've, you've been in touch with some of these concepts, I don't think it's going to be any. Uh, yeah, any and decent. which... Which is really difficult because let me tell you, we've been involved in so many conversations with different universities and different courses about trying to get them to introduce Rust into the curriculum and learning. And mm -hmm. first of all, A, you need professors who are comfortable with the language itself to teach it, yeah. obviously, right? But B, a lot of it is so systemic. It's been the same curriculum for however many years that actually making that change itself is quite scary. So yeah hopefully yeah. there will be some courses that start taking this on a bit sooner because yeah if we can start this earlier on then hey who knows what can kind of come of it but um great i mean like like what have you learned from using rust then i know that's a weird question but like by originally being a c engineer to now being a rust engineer what differences do you see in yourself as an engineer just from making that switch across to the language yeah um Honestly, like really cementing these, uh, let, let's call them like functional, like functional languages, ideas. I don't know a simpler way to say it, but all these, these things that Rust brings from functional languages, like pattern matching, uh, heavy focus on map fold that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. I knew them because I had been in touch, but again, unless you use them every day and you and you start really thinking in those terms and 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 being in touch with other people's code who use them it's really in your everyday um it makes a huge difference uh it, it's it's less oh i read a book about it and i sort of know what it is to you know i think about that um like i i you know using well let's not get into specific details at least for now but um yeah so being in touch with uh with those on an everyday basis is yeah uh, really makes a big difference another thing is um i i actually think that it makes me more productive and the whole team more productive so okay. you you have the the you know maybe when you're ramping up uh it's more difficult but i think that if you can get a team that have done the ramp the ramping up i think they'll be way more effective again in, in the context of where you need the things that Rust gives you, like performance and whatever. Um, and specifically because, like, for example, when I when I do a code review, so someone else wrote some code and all right, let's let's see, you know, if let's look out for bugs, design, whatnot. Um, when I did that in C, I'd had I'd have to think about 10 like 10 things that I no longer need to think about. I was looking for <laughs> Oh, double freeze! Like, uh, are are we freeing the same pointer twice? Am I accessing memory I'm not supposed to access to? Is, is this is there an input to this that will make me access memory like buffer overflow? Like, you're looking for all of these things. Mm. Um, but in Rust, you, you you don't even think about it. You know, people will say a lot, and I, I I've seen other people on your show say, you know, if it compiles, it's you know, it's a, it's already a big step, and that is so true. Uh, and I'll say it again because it it, it and specifically because. If it compiles, then in my brain, I don't even think about these things anymore. I don't think about memory safety issues. I don't think about uh, concurrency issues. I don't think about any of those. I can focus on, okay, well, the design on, you know, the things that, that I want to focus on. I don't want to be looking yeah, for yeah. double threes and things like that. Um, yeah, so I, I think it may, and again, there are no bugs of, of that kind. Uh, there are definitely bugs, but not of that kind. And that's yeah. a huge, huge improvement. Uh, Just the time so saved, yeah, I, I imagine, is crazy, right? So just in itself that the time saved in itself just from that is yeah. unbelievable Absolutely. right so back to your productivity point like just not having to do that means you can actually continue writing more stuff without being worried about what's already there and also if you're building on top of other things you, you're, you're pretty sure that the stuff underneath it is safe and not going to break apart or fall down exactly. right um exactly which is nuts. um 
Cool. Nice. Um, well, look, you've, you've made that transition across into Rust. Um, you've been loving it, which is great. Um, I'm always here, a big advocate for that. Um, and now you're working, well, you have been working in the blockchain Web3 space for, for, for a bit of time now. Uh, have you been enjoying it? Is it is it a, obviously you loved your math pieces, so it got to merge the two, the, the, your love of math and your love of kind of engineering and, and problem solving together, which is always like a, a big dream for, for a lot of people, right? But so you got to do that. So you're now in, in the blockchain space. Are you are you enjoying it? Is it all what you thought it would be? More? I don't know. What's your kind of take on it? How's how's it been? Um awesome. Absolutely fantastically fun. <laughs> is uh, good. Yeah, I, I I'm and and I, and I'll be like maybe more specific. I'm uh, in, uh, you know, the subset of engineers in blockchain that do blockchain infrastructure. And so I I really think about what makes a blockchain tick, as opposed to, um, you know, we'll have with the same name. We'll all say, oh, we're blockchain engineers, but they're actually yeah. very different roles in the ecosystem, uh, as opposed to people who will you know build on top of that. Uh, yeah more closer to what the users will uh, actually use and and if if you're someone who wants to use rust uh and also who happens like me to really love this you know what makes it tick at the at, like the engine um yeah then this is what you you want to focus on um uh and i forgot your original question no, no, it's I, just I, if you I enjoyed it over the last couple of years. That's oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Fun. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and, and I absolutely enjoy it because I uh, I do get to do all the math stuff, especially in zero knowledge. Uh, now that I'm doing zero knowledge stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, cryptography ha is is a wonderful, and it's specifically zero knowledge cryptography, is it brings things from everywhere. So, so if you want to do like applied math, it does, you know, uh, you, you can go into elliptic curves and you can dig as much as you want there. You can go into like, you know, group theory, a lot of group theory, um, you know, things about polynomials, read mm -hmm. Solomon codes, which end up, you know, which you learn as you're learning these things, you're like, Oh, it's also what we use for like CDs and stuff, DVDs and whatnot. Uh, you know, it, it bleeds into a bunch of other things in, in uh, engineering. Um, and yeah, so, so like you do all this math, and then you code in Rust. It's just like for me, it's just a, a dream come true. This, I mean, that's great. I'm I'm happy you're happy because I don't know. I've been doing this for a while. I've been recruiting in Rust for about four and a half. Almost we're creeping into the five year mark now. And the overriding kind of negativity or the stigma has always been around working in the, this kind of space. And again, I know I don't want to clump everything together because you're absolutely right there's i mean a hundred different kind of sub verticals yeah. that we can get into but it sadly it all gets clumped into one thing of like oh anything but blockchain no no no, no web three for me at all uh and look, everyone has the right to to completely feel like that and that's fine it, it is strange to me though because i i don't know how often a lot of that is just ignorance or if if it's just been learned behaviors of just saying no no no, no web3 no web3 because mm -hmm. my colleagues say that or friends that i know they completely against it or is it again like that's that like i was saying this ignorance piece around oh we chuck crypto in with all of that as well and we know that's a scam and this is none of this is real uh how do you feel about that because don't get me wrong. Sorry, I'm really going off on a tangent here, but I'm quite passionate. Don't get me wrong. I've been I've spoken to so many really weird organizations that literally don't make sense. I remember one time talking, uh, I mentioned this somewhere else before. I remember one time talking to a company who were building like a Web3 social media platform um, where everyone was completely safe. No one knew who each other was, but, you know, it was a good, really social way of interacting with each other, which in itself didn't really make sense because there was no public kind of thing to it. But anyway, I, I continued the conversation. And then my question was, okay, and how are you ever going to make money off of this? And the founders just went quiet for about 15, 20 seconds, and they it felt like a long 15, 20 seconds. And then it was like, oh, well, we'll just get some more funding in and just keep it going. Um, so don't get me wrong. Like I've been involved yeah. in some conversations which make me feel quite uncomfortable, and I think not everyone. You know, it's a very innovative space, and people are trying new things, and 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 sometimes it's not quite right. But as a whole, my experiences have been really, really positive, and the people that I've worked with and interacted with uh, over the last like five years has been fantastic. Um, and so it's really sometimes a bit saddening 
to see this weird stigma behind yeah blockchain equals bad so to to maybe publicly put some things out there like yeah how do you take that how do you set the information give us give us your thoughts on that yeah i mean i think it's a bit of both of there there's i think there's definitely some truth to it but also i think it's incomplete and so like i will acknowledge the negatives of the you know what people typically think oh it's a scam whatever like in 2023 almost 2024 um i i think it's true there's a lot of of uh bad things we we've seen like terrible like hacks and whatnot um yeah that's not uh positive for sure what i think that people don't appreciate enough is is basically why i guess people like me are excited about it so how i see web3 is we have a new primitive that we have to figure out what to do with and i'll i'll get into what like exactly what i mean by that and why i don't think this is negative um so the new primitive is we're now able to like with blockchains what 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 does blockchain give us is we're able to have a database that untrust untrusted actors can share a can agree on and by untrusted is i i i do yeah, I don't trust you to be um, to 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 go according to protocol. Okay, mm-hmm. I, I and this is like we there's literally zero software in the world before you know the Bitcoin paper that yeah. did that ever in the history of humanity. Like, and now we have this thing, and so it it, it grew into oh a bunch of stuff. But um, the big question for me is what can we do with it? And it, it, like, there some people are do know like already have like some mm-hmm. some ideas. Uh, I'll mention Polygon has a value proposition. If you Google like, Polygon value proposition, there's this. Cool, thing yeah, we'll include it in the links. Sure, nice. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's basically a crowdsourcing of uh, why people are excited, like application wise, and and they've got little stories around it, whatnot. Uh, of of things to do with blockchain and how it can change how we do things online, uh, and yeah, so so okay, so we have this new primitive. We have to figure out what to do with it. Uh, of course, you know, there's like money application finance. It's the main one that we see today. I think there's a lot more uh, possibilities. For example, I know Informal Systems was working on, still is working on uh, this thing they call collaborative finance. And then you know the, you need like economists and whatnot, which they do have to to come up with these ideas. But it was this thing of like, oh, we like. Actually, I I, I will not speak for them. Uh, I, I, <laughs> please please look it up. I do not want to. But my 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 what I'm trying to say is that it's so it's so general as a thing. Oh, we have a database that you know untrusted actors can agree on. You need people from all the fields that exist to to think about okay how can i use this thing now and people are and so i think yeah. that's why for people like me who understand the tech very well it's not necessarily easy to say oh well this is what it's good for because well i might require a phd in economics to be able to say oh well if you have that then you can do this other thing or in environmental science or whatever else uh so i will refer to value proposition for these other experts who who say oh well here's how i would like to use this technology um and and I think that's you know there's there's this thing I, I keep reading online and in, in, oh you know uh, technology looking for not just for blockchain but technology looking for a problem or something mm-hmm. and it has a very bad rep and in my experience I, I I think it's happened a lot more in history than people realize I'm not saying like oh just build tech and and whatever through use cases but I think there's also the the you know it's not there's some truth to it but also you know oil when 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 we, we were like, oh, oil, oil is a thing, it's underground. Um, the, 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 the first thing that people, like the reason why people were interested in it is illumination. So to, to replace kerosene lamps from like, that were made from coal and whatever. And, or people like literally used fat from animals and, yeah. um, and they, they just lived in darkness at night other than that. And then, oh, well, oil is a, a good way to illuminate and, you know, and then you get uh, standard oil and all these things. Only later came uh like oh let's do use it use it for propulsion and then you you get you know the world of today where like 
you know, we, we, there's heating, there's like everything. And, and so maybe the analogy with, with oil is that you have this new thing, or, you know, you can talk about the semiconductor as well of like, oh, well now we can do zeros and ones, uh, at, like at a very small, uh, level later came the, the, the graphics display, uh, you know, initially it was just to com like compute tables of, of artillery or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then later came like a visual, visual display that was not thought of when they were thinking about the, the um, uh, yeah, like the original ideas of, from Bell Labs of like semiconductors. My point is when you have such a, a groundbreaking change in we can do this thing now, I expect a decent amount of years, you know, that counts can count in one, two, three decades to really figure out what to do with it. And so I'm yeah. not surprised that that we don't fully that what we see today in blockchain, you know, the, the the current materialization of the technology is not what I expect it to be in 10 years or in 20 years. It is yeah. a very long way to say. No, no, I I like that. I like that viewpoint and things and the analogy there because we are still incredibly early on in, in this and as with any sort of change there's always this i don't know resistance to change in, in any sort of setting in day-to-day -day world nothing to do with with the tech side of things you know you implement some sort of new change into your team or into work there's always that that bell that curve of you know the the willingness to adopt change um and we're exactly there. We're in that resistance phase early on and that no phase. And then some people start adopting and other people's joining. And then eventually you get to that point where there we go. We've we've gone over that mound and we're absolutely fine. Um, it's, it's interesting. But but what I find interesting is that in my five years, I mean, I'm sure it's been around for longer, but in my five years of looking into this, it has um, been such crazy growth and change that it's it's almost undeniable. And for people to just completely block it and say, absolutely not, never, is really close-minded. And hopefully, as the, the space continues to grow, um, people are going to jump on board or get left behind, basically, right? Uh, realistically, um, I don't know. That might be controversial. Yeah, I mean, I there, there's a lot of interesting things to work on in this world. So, like, I think th there are other fields to, to be happy in, but I, I do believe that this one will end up having a massive, like, I believe that when I'll be older, I'll be able to tell my grandchildren that, oh, back in the day, blockchain had a bad, had bad rep. If they even know what it is, because it might yeah, even yeah. be a back end thing that no one knows what it is and it's just how it works. But yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So do you, do you feel like we don't need to beat the stigma behind it or just naturally happen? I feel like perhaps it probably will just naturally fight its own cause, right? There's no real need to be real advocates for it. We just kind of let it, let it, let it materialize. I mean, I think what you're doing here, like trying to to to, to have a, a space to give you know alternate views, is a is a good start. But no, I think I mean, in my experience, it, from within the industry, uh, people are extremely excited about it, and so uh, yes, yeah, yeah. I think it's well. Tell us about it. Tell us about your work at the moment. What what have you been up to? What what you've been working on at the moment? Um, yeah, so I'm working on the uh, so-called Maiden rollup. Uh, that specifically uses the Maiden VM. And so if we start, let's say with the Maiden VM, which is a virtual machine that can produce proofs as its, of its own execution, that's the very cool thing about it, is that you're able to run a program on it and it's gonna output the answer or like the result of the computation in a, and also with it a proof that a verifier can, can basically not run the, the thing and know that, you know, if I have a Costco bill and the, it's a very long bill <laughs> and the, 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 the sum is, you know, $400 or whatever. Um, then I, I, a prover can, you know, run this sum and tell you it's 407 and 97 cents and the verifier without going through and doing it, um, uh, you know, on, on, on their machine can know, uh, yeah. Like I, I, tr I, not, I trust you. I, I verified that it is indeed the right sum without doing it uh, themselves. So, so that's what this does. And, and yes, we have like a compiler team that, uh, that is allowing you to write programs in Rust and compile them for the VM. Uh, you know, it, it, so you're basically recreating computers, but with this new cryptographic, uh, 
twist to it. It's super cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then what do we do with that is we put it in a, we create a blockchain around it that can basically, you can have a prover that runs the protocol of the blockchain and then tell everyone else, hey, this is, you know, with, without getting to the specifics, because I'm not sure how oh, it's okay. people are oh, with okay. exactly how blockchains work. But, you know, if you think as a list of blocks, it can tell, well, here's the next block. And I will also give you the proof that I, I computed it properly. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is like at a high level what what we're working on. Amazing, uh, it's pretty yeah. cool stuff, eh? Nice. And and it you mentioned so, cool. so Rust is being used throughout it. How? Why? Maybe let's start there. Really simply, what? Why Rust instead of anything else? Yep. Uh, why Rust? Uh, Rust is one choice out of <clears throat> uh, many candidates. Uh, there are um, other projects using. Um, Things like Go is another one that's used, yeah. but people are starting to see that it's, uh, like the ones in Go are typically slower, and so they're they're rewritten in Rust. Um, uh, yeah, and there 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 are other languages that are possible. Why we use Rust specifically is um, well, honestly, a little bit everything that we've described. So we get, uh, earlier in the podcast, so we we have the 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 speed like the. Mm -hmm. The program itself runs really quickly. The, the output is very quick. Um, uh, it, it gives you all these these safeties that alternatives like C, C++, in that category wouldn't give you. And also it gives you a, a very nice type system and all these things, again, that we've discussed that makes program, in my opinion, a lot easier to understand uh, than for things like Python or JavaScript, where you typically uh, don't have any type information. Rust has a very rich type system. I mean, there are improvements uh, to be made, but like in in my experience, it is very good. And I think some people from the pro, uh, from the uh, functional languages will say, "Oh, it's not rich enough. It doesn't do this. Doesn't do that." It's it's very good. Let's say like it, sure. it, it like it, it's very good enough at least for to be able to express. Um, Things such as when I, I I read a program, I understand a lot better than if I didn't have that type system. Is all I'm trying to say. Yeah, um, hundred so yeah, percent. Makes cool. for clear programs that run fast. Great. On on the on the on the speed side of things. So obviously you mentioned, hey, in instances, some of the Go stuff is a little bit slower. So that they're, they're looking at or are rewriting things in Rust. Do, do you know? Do you know off the top of your head, and maybe you don't, like what the difference is between those two instances? Like how much quicker it is, or how much more efficient this is like did you know yeah uh there are benchmarks online and i don't have the numbers off the top of my head we're sure. talking like i mean don't quote me on that but you know is it yeah. 10 is it 100x i i don't know exactly and um the 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 main difference is uh go will have a um like managed memory and so it has a runtime uh mm -hmm. that will you know run every once in a while i don't know exactly how go does it but um basically clean up the memory for you and for that it needs to do some things in the background so at the same time as your program is running you also need to take care of these things um so that adds an overhead um it, and yeah so basically like you know at a very high level the abstractions that go give you like go routines and whatnot are not free in the sense that they require runtime uh computation and that is uh yeah a, like the short answer to why yeah yeah uh, things in rust would be faster cool nice There's no no, no that's fine it. yeah yeah for sure oh god i mean yeah yeah don't don't get me wrong like people could probably talk about this for for two hours exactly. in itself, it's a right whole so topic. Yeah. It, but but those things are available for people to see somewhere like is that all available uh, public knowledge yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there. So, the one instance I'm thinking of uh, is so there's the Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum, for those who don't know, is a very popular blockchain, and uh, that allows you to run programs. And um, the, I believe it was the first, or at least the most popular for a very long time, um, yeah. software that people ran. If you want to be part of the Ethereum uh, blockchain, you would run this thing called Geth. G E T H. Mm -hmm. 
and there's a bunch of others, um, but there's one of this year called Reth. So, I, or they're not sure how to say it, but R E T H, mm-hmm. and it is basically, you know, what Geth does, but in Rust, and um, by Paradigm, the company, and uh, they again all open source. So it's not their software, but it, it was yeah. a team from Paradigm who wrote it. Same thing for Polygon. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, so I would go to like, I think they have benchmarks either on their GitHub or one of their talks. I forget exactly where, but that, that's where I get this. Uh, and th- there are other instances of that in the uh, yeah. people moving from go into rust. Amazing. The reason I ask is cause fundamentally we always talk about, oh, it's so much quicker. It's this, it's that, it's the other thing. And people who maybe aren't using Rust right now, they hear the same kind of things. And frankly, after four and a half years of talking about this and like preaching uh, from my side, obviously I'm not particularly technical, but what I'd like to do is back it with some actual cold hard Mm -hmm. stats these days. And what I'm most grateful for is that the community, especially in blockchain things, so one, one really, really commendable thing that I can like really back and pat them, the people in this space on the back for is, everything almost everything seems to be open source right almost like yeah, okay absolutely. there are things and instances but every, everyone's incredibly open about this By is and large, what yeah. we're doing we are very very transparent of what we're doing whereas traditional tech i suppose definitely aren't right they might release bits here and there but fundamentally this is our property we keep this for ourselves um so all of this information that we're talking about usually nine times up 10 is completely readily available for anyone to go and look and see for themselves. So you know this isn't nonsense and this isn't us just preaching and, and saying what we need to say. Um, and of course you'd say that, yeah, it's brilliant. Of course it is because you're working in it. But um, no, no, go ahead and look for yourself and make your own assumptions, right? So yeah, it's awesome that this information is readily available and it helps me when I go about helping with consultancy and, and helping on different projects and, and trying to introduce the right Rust talent to projects is, you know, Rust is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what Google keeps telling me, but also here's specific instances of where it is good uh, and how much better it is versus other things. So that's great. Amazing. Amazing. And what do you think is, this is a huge question, unless there's further you wanted to dive into with, with your work right now, or is there anything else you want to talk uh, about? No, well, I mean, maybe just like to, to agree with you on that one of, so I think, one thing that I really like about the it, it, everything's open source, and honestly, the the like Microsoft used to be closed source only, and in yeah. the latest years they've gone a lot better. And so it's not to say the blockchain is the only um, uh, thing that you know AI. Also, they have a bunch of open source stuff. Yeah, but it, but it is true that like basically everything you see in in uh, in blockchain is. And uh, blockchain, I'll include like zero knowledge uh, research mm-hmm. and all that, uh, even though it's not only for blockchain. Um, yeah, it, there's really the open source culture. What that enables also is, I believe, a lot more creativity because I can go and and if people do that a lot. They, they'll yeah. pick the thing and then they'll they'll fork it, and so they they'll say, all right, I'll, I'll pick it up from here and I'm going going to go in that other direction, uh, and they don't have to rewrite everything that was already. Uh, yeah, yeah, done in that. They just pick it up from from there. All right, I'm, I just want to add this little thing. And uh, I forget exactly. I think it's the um, it's like Halo Two is a, uh, yeah. a, a zero knowledge thing, uh, and that's like a specific. I I didn't play uh, around it too much, but I, I spoken to some people who did. And in that community, there's like five different forks of of people. Like the main Halo Two repo, and they're like, oh, there's like this variation, this variation, this, and you couldn't do that if it was not open source and all in Rust. And so, uh, yeah, very cool. It's amazing, man. I, I know and, and it's something that I've been pushing for so much in not just my podcast, but in any sort of interactions I have with even people trying to get into Rust is get onto GitHub, have a look around, start getting excited about a project and just join in and help out um, because the community is welcoming it. And yeah, that innovation is there for, for the taking, right? So. Amazing. Yeah, I'll, okay, I'll recommend cool. that there's a newsletter by the Rust. I think it's officially by the Rust project. Uh, it's called This Week in Rust. And yes. in there, they there's like a bunch of topics every week. And in there specifically, there are projects who call for help. So people who are looking to, to learn Rust and, and try and like do some concrete things, you can you know go and 
you know, follow This Week in Rush or you look at uh, older posts and go at look at projects who need help. They're like, they're, yeah. it's all it's all there. So there's yeah. it's uh, that is my Bible. That honestly, every Thursday, I think it's every Thursday morning UK time. Uh, I mean, that's not a time, but anyway, Thursday mornings for me uh, here in, in the UK, I that's the first thing I do. So tomorrow morning, that's the first thing I'm going to do is have a read of that. But yeah, I think we're on episode five or, or uh, week 523. So yeah, that is, so there's long. plenty of reading there for, for anyone and yeah. then plenty of projects there for, for anyone to get involved with. But um, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, that, that leads us. So, so what's what big question now, big, big question. What, what for you, and we've already kind of touched upon it that there are a million different iterations of all these different things. But like for you, what is the future of blockchain or the future of zero knowledge proofs or the future of yeah this space for you? Where do you see it changing in the next one, three, five years? What, what do you think is going to happen? Um, again, to <laughs> my earlier point of it, like, yeah, you would ask an economist, they, they would say something different than whatever. I'll give my, the, the thing I can talk more about, which is um, specifically the infrastructure. And if I look, you know, five years, what I hope that we'll be able to achieve is to make it, make, make, make you know, blockchain systems go, be a lot more uh, efficient. And that being able to process a lot more transactions or, 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 state changes or you know whatever you want to call it data than mm -hmm. they currently do and why i think that's not just cool because it's fast um because it allows for new use cases when uh you know for example when your uh, uh like now that we have like very fast gpus they uh, we're able to think about doing like uh, like re uh, face recognition in real time, for example. Like there are new use use cases that are available when you got when you get some speed. Um, uh, and I think that it is the case with blockchain right now. It's like very slow, and so you're very limited in what you can do. I believe that if we can make it a lot faster, then a lot of these other experts are going to be able to say, "Well, now maybe I can I can think about this use case." Um, that's what I'll say. So how how is how is it how so just to go back so doing it right now is slower than what the traditional means is that what we're saying right now in in some cases so let's let's use the face right. verification like premise in itself so right now if we were to do that through normal traditional blockchain uh, non traditional means through like the blockchain side let's say that is slower than the normal way. Sorry. As so in, so know? yeah. So I was trying. So the face recognition, I wasn't thinking specifically as a uh, use case for, for blockchain. Uh, it was more an analogy of if I had a lot more computing power, now I can start thinking about these new use cases. Right. Um, so, but to answer your question of uh, slower than what or faster than what, uh, yeah. like right now, if you look at the, the Maiden VM uh, you know, as one metric of, of slowness or, or fastness, um, you know, it's a, I, I forget the latest benchmarks, but it's, you know, we're talking uh, a million times slower than uh, than your processor, maybe. Okay. Uh, yeah, a thousand. Uh, or, or, you know, I, I don't know exactly, you know, but a lot slower. Um, and it's not just the mind of the end. You can, you can look at Ethereum. Ethereum does like maybe, oh boy, uh, is it like, a couple of transactions per second, you know, ten or less, basically, um, and so that means that in order to to participate in that network, you're fighting against a lot of other people, and so prices go up. Um, what I meant by fast is, let's say that we're able to do um, crazy number, like a ten thousand transactions per second. I think that's the number that people use to compare with the Visa network. Like the Visa okay, can cool. do up to ten thousand transactions per second. Well, what you can do, like if we just think about payments, which blockchain can do a lot more, but if you think just about payments, if you are able to support 10,000 transactions per second, then you can replace Visa. You can be at, uh, like mm -hmm. people will basically be able to use their credit card and it gets processed in a normal or expected amount of time, as opposed to, you know, you scan your credit card as a, very much an analogy, you scan your 
credit card and you wait, you know, 10 minutes uh, yep. for it to be processed. So that, that's what I mean by slow and enabling new use cases. Is, gotcha. You know, I, I two wait separate things, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. I mean, and and do we think, and how how quickly do we think that curve of, of improvement is going to be? Is it going to be quite steady over the course of the next five years? Is it quite difficult to tell because there's innovation always happening? Could it literally happen within, would, let's say, Traditionally, we'd look at it and go, yeah, it'd probably take us five years. May that even potentially be one or two years based on the things that we're seeing and the, the advancements that we're, we're having? Or I don't know, is it really, really difficult to tell because there's just so much going on? There's, it's very difficult to tell because people have very different ideas of the mechanism that we should use to make it go faster. Mm -hmm. uh, be it a, like just to give out a name, like ZK Rollup or... Um, uh, uh, some people are looking at the optimistic rollups or a mix of both or not rollups at all or something else or uh, just exactly how you achieve that. If we're only looking at speed, how you achieve that speed, uh, there's not even a consensus of the best way to do that. And so basically asking how long is it going to take? Ultimately, what you're asking is how long is it going to take? What turns out to be the best, quote unquote, the best approach? Um, I don't know. Really that's so exciting that's know. so exciting i think like many people might get turned off by that straight away going what there's no direction like what are we, what are we working on how is it working but for, for a lot of people especially in your kind of field and in space that's incredibly exciting that there is no almost end goal there's no blocker stopping you there's no kind of ceiling for you to hit it's just go and attack it and find out what happens and because everything is open source and readily available that information is shared across everything which means hopefully that these things will come quicker and quicker and quicker as we get better and better and better right so I don't know to me that's super exciting to some people that is maybe one of the reasons why they're put off by it because they just don't know what the point of it is almost if there is no end goal but like Hey, but for me, no, that's I mean, super exciting. There's so much innovation; it's 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 really crazy. I think the the culture in blockchain, at least in my experience, is people are not afraid to try new things, and mm. that is so refreshing. And that also the fact that you know we we don't really know how to go where we want to go, and again, people will disagree on where we want to go, and which well, <laughs> makes it all a little crazy. Um, but it really feels like you, as an individual, you can really make a difference like and that yeah. is huge it doesn't feel like you'll be a you know a cog and in, in, in a you know larger and you, you you know no no. there's really like concrete things you can do to to contribute to that and it, it's uh yeah it's very empowering and it's very exciting of course it's it's for it's not for everyone but i think if if i know a lot of people in academia that's what they're looking for it's very like paper driven and where can i contribute um I really get this feeling in, in blockchain. People are, there's a lot to explore. People are exploring and they're typically not afraid of new ideas, new, um, yeah, yeah, trying new things. And, and, and the exciting thing is, it is, it is, it is. And what's even more exciting is now, slowly but surely, that, that academia wrote that you're talking about historically in the space again i'm talking going back four years ago when we were recruiting for different uh blockchain projects they would want people who had commercial experience even back then right of like we need some people who've done one or two years of doing this before we would never consider looking at someone straight out of university or uh, college um and now it's it's pretty normal really to have people come straight from yes maybe they've gone through their they're undergrads, they've gone, done their masters, now their PhDs and just go straight into work, right? Obviously they've done the fundamentals, but even people who've just come straight out of their undergrad are getting opportunities to work in this space and be part of that innovation, which is quite rare. Uh, like it's It's been a new thing. So it's exciting to see where that next generation of kind of people take this really, because you know they're not limited by uh, a career for the last 10 years where they've been told what to do, but they're straight away right off the bat being told, go be free and figure out what we should do. Um, super exciting, yeah. super, super exciting. Uh, like one one thing for me was that I, I don't need to be in academia to contribute to the cutting edge of this field. Uh -huh. And 
and academia, there's also people in academia doing it. That's not to say. It, I think it just, it, it really, that's the, the only field. Eh, it's not very true. It's not the only field, but it is very true in this field that the, um, the, the, the newest ideas that are, you know, let's say very popular and gain traction uh, come from both worlds, like both academia mm -hmm. and industry. And uh, I try both and I, I prefer industry. And I was very happy to see that uh, there is a, a route to be able to contribute in that way. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and again, so, so all, all the more power. It's, it's really, if you can, you know, if you can figure it out, then, then it's, it's there for the taking kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so yeah. There's no uh, artificial boundaries or anything. Cool. Well, I'm excited, man. I'm excited. Well, look, um, what I'd like to do is, unless there's anything else you wanted to chat about, what, what I'd like to do is finish off with, um, uh, just a couple of questions that I ask everyone that uh, I invite on the show and, and have a chat about, uh, mainly about where you go to learn. And, and it seems like, especially in, in your line of work now, uh, that there's a certain freedom for you to go out and, and figure things out for yourself and, and where do you go to learn. But to bring it specifically to the Rust side of things, let's start from scratch again. So look, were you to completely forget, well, not forget, but let's say you were to start all over again in Rust now, and learning what you have learned over the last couple of years, what's actually helped you, what hasn't helped you, what's slowed down your progress, what's sped that up. You know, what, what tips can you give to someone listening now who is going to make that step into learning Rust? Where would you begin? What, what would you recommend? Um, yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, I will uh, preface this with. Um, the learning is messy. And so I will try and give, you know, a nice and sure. cleaned up route. Uh, anyone listening to this wanting to get into Rust or anything for that matter, I think you shouldn't be discouraged if it's not this nice and clean route. It is, in my experience, never clean. Like learning mm -hmm. is very messy. You go in there, you try and find a new video, you try it, you do a couple of days in that. Turns out it was a dead end. You lost, quote unquote, a few days. and Or you tried like, oh, I'm going to try and contribute to that project. You fail completely because you don't understand anything. But like, yeah, it, it is messy. So I'll just, no matter what, it, it will be messy. <laughs> and I think like if if you go in uh, expecting that, I think you should go in expecting that. No matter what, it'll be messy. Okay. With that, with that being said, um, I would recommend the, the Rust book is really good. And I think it, it comes with the, uh, you just Google Rust book. It's like, it's written by the, like this, the Rust people. Yeah. And um, it's, it's really good. So um, I would start with that, get to where, uh, or until you're, um, if you get bored, honestly, there's Rust by example. If you prefer, I'd say what, either Rust by example or Rust book. I'm someone who prefers more like text and examples, which is what the Rust book gives you. Some people find that very boring. So then there's the Rust by example. That's another alternative. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't try it, but I've heard really good things. Um, and get to a point where you can like contribute to, like write little programs, do all that while you're learning and, and try and do little, little things. Try and get to a point where you can go in this week in Rust, find a project that you find cool and, and try and make a change or, or even or even understand, like, we don't say that enough. People always say, oh, try and make an open source contribution. Honestly, when you're learning a new, a new language that is difficult, even understanding like what it, how it does certain things can be a great achievement. And so okay. I'd say like, try to get to that point. And there's gonna be some back and forth. Oh, I, I'm kind of bored, let me try and do this like open source thing. And then you go and you don't understand anything that gives you motivation to go back to the book. and. Uh, but yeah, so basically try and do the book or Rust by example until you can do a project. And then the project is really when you cement your ideas or when you when you you start making mistakes. Like one mistake I made, for example, is I overused, um, in my opinion, overused uh, trade objects, so-called trade objects. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it doesn't matter exactly what they are, but I was like, oh, you know, dynamic... Uh, Dynamic typing, yeah, it's, that's fine. Like in most languages, and turns out it's not really good in Rust. There's a lot of restrictions uh, called, you know, trade object safety. If you look for that, um, 
and those I was like, okay, sure. There's a there's a there's a list of things that are not very good about it, whatever. But when I really experimented with it, it gave me also a, a, a peer into, like a, a, a view into, um, not only maybe not the shortcomings of Rust, but don't use that part at least. <laughs> um, so what I'm trying to say with this is there is a limitation to just reading the book. It's what I'm trying to get to. Is really when yeah, you yeah. play with it, when you make these kind of mistakes, you design a program with a with an initial idea, and you you see, oh, that was a mistake. Uh, that's when you you kind of put everything together uh, and yeah. you know, get a, getting a job obviously uh, but you have to do these oh things eventually things. hopefully yeah yeah and how and how did you find but maybe you had a bit of a different journey but how, how did you find being told no by the the compiler a lot you know no this doesn't work no 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 because that's one of the things over the years that i think has put a few people off and the ones that eventually do go on to love it um they just broke through that being told no and now they're like oh it's the best thing ever without it you know that's the whole point of it but many exactly. engineers you've maybe been productive for 10 15 years already writing whatever language now um is there a trick or is it literally just a bit of grit and determination and just like okay no this is how it is i've just got to learn to 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 love it to being told no right well i think there's a at least in my experience there's a you reach a point where it says no a lot less sure. because you, um, I think no's come from misunderstanding the core principles mm -hmm. or, or, you know, a very large statement and it will be not true for some cases, but like by and large, when you, the compiler says no is because you misunderstood something. And for me, at least the, like going back to the book, like understanding why the ownership rules are important, why is it important that you can only have one mutable reference at a time uh, to a to a to a given object, and like if it goes back to these core principles, and then you know then you get into the nitty gritty details of being told no all the time, you are told no a lot less when you gain experience, and yeah. to the point that you know. I'm rem I'm reminded in this conversation that this was the case, but it really <laughs> it's not that I write pro perfect programs at all, but no. it is it's not uh, it's not an issue. Really. No, no, no. Cool. No, no. It's just something that's over the years come up. But okay, perfect. Okay, that's yeah, and to be honest, that answer is very similar to what a lot of people say, which is good. And I think people should take comfort in just playing around with it, have some fun, learn it, take your time with it, and eventually it'll just happen. But um, okay, but what about now? What about these days? Like, do you have any sort of uh, other, I don't know, in, in terms of your current work and current projects, do you have any sort of book recommendations or where do you go to for wider reading? Obviously you mentioned This Week in Rust, which is uh, an awesome like stop place to go to, but I mean, obviously you're encouraged to buy work anyway, to go out there and learn bits and bobs but is there any anywhere else in particular you could recommend or any books that people should read i don't know of any books because i have not used them myself mm -hmm. uh i again i think that's different i never did that for any language and so um there are probably blog posts that are that are worth reading i like these days honestly it's either i i look up a specific you know, API documentation or the documentation of a specific crate online or library mm -hmm. or the Rust reference for something like really specific that I'm wondering. But I, uh, I'm, I don't know everything about Rust, uh, <laughs> but it, like, it, it is not, I don't need to actively learn new things about Rust anymore. And so, um, maybe I'm not, I'm not even the best person to ask anymore because there's probably okay. new content that I'm not even aware of that's that could have helped me and I, I wouldn't know about it. But again, the, the book and the Rust by examples is the one I can for sure say is a good starting point. And then from there, the transition, there might be some good blog posts, but. Uh. Cool. No, that's fine. I mean, uh, we, so we, uh, every year, we obviously add loads of people we talk to probably i don't know 100 100 rust engineers a week let's say on average between us in, in my team um and we add people onto uh the people that want to then eventually work with us and and want to network with us we eventually add them into our into our database and every year we release uh, a survey 
to go out to everyone that we've worked with or interacted with and ask them to kind of con conduct like salary findings and all these things that basically help the industry and then give like a bit of a benchmarking thing for 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 potential new clients that we're working with but also just the community in general this year one of the additional sub questions we added into there was around where do you go to learn what reading material could you offer up so that talent and salary slash everything report will be released uh, at the beginning of the year 2024 so in a couple of weeks time we'll have that data so anything else that I find I will definitely whack out there for people to read and I'll send you a, a version of it as well because there might be some areas for you to read up on and, and we go for sure. yeah. but um nice cool well look I mean thanks very much for your time I, I genuinely appreciate it it's uh yeah you're the first blockchain extraordinaire to, to kind of join me today uh on on the podcast um so yeah I'm really keen to hear everyone's thoughts and hopefully you're open to the idea that uh, people may want to reach out to you and have a chat and see what's going on. Um, sure. Guests previous have been really, really happy about the engagement on that side. So, hey, whoever's listening and watching out there and we've got to this point, please feel free to, to reach out to Phil and see uh, uh, what we can do together. But uh, I'll also include some of the the uh, links that we discussed, so the value proposition stuff from Polygon, that would be nice. Uh, the wreath, how are we going to call it? Wreath uh, of pieces. I'll have a I look at that as well. Okay, Reth, yeah. fine. Let's go with that. We'll go with the Reth. Uh, and whatever else we, we might dig out, I'll, I'll make sure to... This Week in Rust, as always, I mean, it's my fan favourite, so um, we'll put that into, uh, yeah, the comments as well, so people can have a little watch and a read. But um, I thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, and anyone wanting to reach out, please do so. I'm happy to help where I can where I can be of help. So, Good. I'm, and I'm thank sure you for people... having me on. This is... Uh, I, so, sorry, I, I just... I, I told you offline, but I think there's not enough Rust podcasts. And so that's why I was very happy to come in this on this one because, um, yeah, I think people should talk about Rust on podcasts uh, even more. So uh, thank you for doing this. Oh, no, it's honestly, it's been my pleasure. And it comes, yeah, from a genuine place of interest. Uh, and I, I think the recruitment world, I've definitely seen this year has evolved a lot into doing steps like this into content and just engaging with people and having conversations like this because the more we can spread the the message and the the, the rust love out there, the better it is for everyone involved really. So for me it's just the perfect kind of storm of getting to chat to some interesting people like yourself and talking through some things and uh yeah, getting some content out there for people. But um no, thanks again Phil. Um look we'll we'll finish things up there but thanks very much all the best thanks to you